let's check out the data files. The Netflix business model is a mix of on-demand subscription models and an all-you-can-eat business model. It's without a doubt at some point you've been chatting to a friend and they've mentioned a show to you that you shouldn't miss, to which you promptly ask, is that on Netflix? It may surprise you to know that Netflix is more than 20 years old and when it was founded back in 1998, it was just a DVD rental service by mail. Since then, Netflix has been one of the largest streaming providers of entertainment content on the planet and perhaps the biggest platform responsible for the growth of the video streaming industry as a whole. Saying that, its popularity has waned over the last year. This recent chart from Whip Media shows Netflix now only ranks fourth out of the biggest streaming providers in the US regarding subscriber satisfaction. Whilst it can't be disputed that a share of 80% satisfied customers is a considerable achievement, the concern is that a year before on the same survey, Netflix had managed a score of 90% satisfaction. There isn't a single reason for Netflix declining performance. There's more of a accumulation of reasons. For one, disappointment with the service's original programming has mounted over the last months. The company also generated less than favorable headlines with its decision to curb account sharing across multiple households. No, God! No, God, please, no, no! All of this has in some shape or form culminated to Netflix losing 1.2 million subscribers in the first two quarters of 2022 alone. Now, it's perhaps too early to be analyzing the situation and asking why, for the first time in what feels like forever, is Netflix struggling? But the thing is, being in business myself, seeing a chink in the armor of a business that had the biggest head start in its industry is nerve wracking. How do we protect our businesses? What can we learn? Well, here's my current take. Being one of the first to market, Netflix got to have a pick of the bunch when it came to choosing which shows to license and air on its platform. It licensed its content from the most popular channels and it was a delight as viewers got to watch entire box sets of shows in binge sessions and just like that, all of us forgot about how we were watching TV in the normal way. Netflix had unwittingly instigated a disruption in not just cinema, but television too. Presumably, the big wigs at the service identified the risk of having all its content being licensed in. And so, a production arm was open for the service, where they were funding shows, movies, documentaries, you name it, they made it all. All in a bid to generate a strong bank of content over which Netflix has complete rights and not just license rights. The thing is though, as Netflix set about shoring up its content library, the television and the cinema houses that had been disrupted started paying attention. If platforms such as Netflix and Amazon Prime can thrive on the basis of their proprietary content, surely they could too. So as Netflix busied itself making content, production houses such as HBO, Disney, Paramount and Discovery busied themselves making their own version of Netflix. Cut to today, despite many of their platforms being a bit clunkier and less intuitive and way less slick than Netflix platform, streamers such as HBO and Disney have taken a sizable portion of Netflix users' attention with no signs of stopping. The business learn here is twofold. If you're the Netflix of your industry, the goal isn't to just disrupt a marketplace. If and when you manage it, you need to secure your competitive advantage by creating a large enough gap that is harder for disrupted competitors to cross. Netflix sought to maintain its competitive gap by playing the production houses at the game they were already playing and winning, making content. The difference being that the competitors had back catalogues of decades back with considerable goodwill along with know-how of what it takes to make good content. In the bid to get content out fast, 60 to 70%, this is based on no data, this is my opinion, but 60 to 70% of Netflix content is formulaic, predictable content that's struggling to stand the test of time. If I was sitting in the Netflix boardrooms, rather than just making content, I would have advocated to create a larger gap between ourselves and the competitors by focusing on what made Netflix stand out. 
its platform technology. This could have been in the form of watch parties with live chat or webcam viewing of other people watching the show with you or fandom community forums and user generated content sharing thoughts about the shows, basically 50% of what's happening on YouTube and TikTok right now, all with a strong emphasis on mobile. This would have made the Netflix user experience so superior and differentiated that disrupted competitors would have no notion how on earth they could catch up to this. The second business learn here from the perspective of the disruptive competitors is that if and when someone disrupts your marketplace, don't panic. Don't ignore the wealth of knowledge you already have about the marketplace and the customer. Instead, channel all your earned experiences into your efforts to compete with the disruptor. HBO and Disney's whole competitive edge is the well-established Goodwill-heavy back catalogue and their know-how of how to continue making compelling content. So far, this seems to be working in slowing down the disruptor. Now, if I was them and I wanted to go for the kill, I would be investing more into the platforms and providing the user what Netflix isn't on its platform, connection. I would shore up my fandom goodwill by giving them a space to share and interact with each other and the content talent. I feel like I've just given away a secret worth millions here. I'll see you in the next one.